Um, thank you for having me. Uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'd like to learn a little bit more about the audience. Um, I uh, uh, am an engineer by training. I worked for big companies for about 10 years before starting my own company. Uh, I grew that company for 12 years, and uh, it was in the electronic materials space, so we were a material supplier to people who uh, made electronic multi-layer ceramic capacitors, the most prolific capacitive component in the world. Your uh, cell phone probably has about uh, 500 of these little uh, uh, components in it. Um, after selling the company to DuPont uh, a long time ago, uh, yes, please, I became an uh, angel investor, and I, uh, be, I made my first angel investment in 1980, so 32 years ago. And I've now made more than 50 angel investments and have written more than 80 checks. Uh, so that probably means that, no, I think that's pretty pretty confident. I could be pretty confident in saying I've lost more money in angel investing than anybody in the room. And maybe, <laughs> and maybe more angel investment than all of the rest of you in the room put together. Who knows? Um, but I also have had some uh, really nice exits, uh, and that's good. Um, in fact, why don't I sort of tell this story at the beginning? Um, <clears throat> If you go to Las Vegas, and actually there are a lot of parallels between angel investing and blackjack, uh, a lot of risk parallels. So if you go to Las Vegas and you play a table game and you take $100 out of your pocket and you put it on the table and you win three or $400 and you take your $100 out of, off the table and put it back in your, in your pocket, now you're playing with house money. And so, as an angel investor, I've been playing with house money since 1987. So uh, if I have a really nice win, I take a little more money off the table and continue to play with house money. So uh, you won't find very many old guys like me running around the world talking about angel investment who are still waiting for their first exit. Because if you've been waiting for 32 years for your first exit, you're probably playing with your grandchildren or skiing or or uh, uh, swimming, or playing tennis, or playing golf, but you're probably not angel investing anymore. So exits are a really important component to angel investing. And actually on Thursday morning, we're going to have a, a, a workshop on how to exit angel investments early. Early exits is a new strategy in, in angel investing. So. I've been angel investing for 32 years. Uh, I've helped start, um, actually as a founding member, four angel organizations in the US. Um, I've probably advised 30 or 40 other angel groups and I've taught uh, workshops like this more than 100 times in uh, I think 35 of the US states and I think nine countries now. So uh, um, it's, it's something that I probably enjoy doing or I probably wouldn't be here. So excuse me for a minute while I change the screen. So uh, here's what we're going to cover today. But before we do that, I would like to survey the room. So there, are, let's say there are three main categories of people in the room. Uh, angel investors or people who are be interested in becoming angel investors, entrepreneurs or uh, wannabe entrepreneurs who are thinking about raising angel capital, and some uh, service provider people, attorneys, uh, newspaper people, accountants, bankers, who sort of support, or government officials who so support the ecosystem of entrepreneurs and angel investors. So how many angel investors are in the room? So that looks like at least half. How many entrepreneurs are in the room? 
Uh, quite a number of entrepreneurs. And how many service providers? Okay, so uh, I would say about uh, 60, 30, 10. 60% uh, angels, 30%, you can test me on that later. 30% uh, uh, entrepreneurs and 10% uh, uh, service providers. So here's what we're going to uh, <coughs> go over quickly today. And I will tell you that um, I'm not going to use a mic. And if you have trouble hearing me, uh, raise your hand. Um, and I really, really appreciate and encourage you to ask questions. Uh, because uh, I know it's boring for you to have a talking head in front of the room. Uh, and it's also no fun for me uh, if all I do is uh, talk to you from the slides. So uh, please uh, ask questions, and I actually have a lot of stopping points in this talk where I'm going to encourage you to ask questions. So I'm not going to read these slides. I'm going to uh, suggest that you've probably already read them, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, this word should be valley, not value. <laughs> I, I don't know how that happened. The valley of death. Uh, is where uh, entrepreneurial ventures dies. Now it seems that most of the, uh, and this is a plot of cash or profits, uh, most of the companies that I invest in, they start down this curve and they just keep going like this. Um, that's called a minus one X return. Uh, uh, getting less back than you invested. This is a very important chart. Um, to summarize the capital food chain for entrepreneurs. Um, we expect entrepreneurs to be totally committed to their ventures. So we expect them to uh, uh, put all of their resources and, and commit all of their time to ventures. So the first, back at the idea stage, the first investors are uh, the entrepreneurs themselves. And the next source is uh, government sources and uh, friends and family, and they invest in pre-seed ideas, uh, development of the prototype of the product, uh, demonstration of the product, uh, but it's only at the time that customers first see a product that is typical of when angels get involved. So right here when the curve begins to turn, uh, when the company begins to have some revenues and contacts with customers, or at least some customer validation, that's when angel investors begin to invest. And there are seed venture capitalists and super angels that invest at the same time we do, uh, we angels. Traditional venture capital tends to invest when the company has revenues. And to today's marketplace, uh, oft times when companies already have some earnings. So venture capitalists are funding growth, and angel investors are uh, funding uh, startup uh, stage companies. Uh, in the US, there's not a lot of competition between VC and angel. If there is a venture capital in a deal, it is subsequent, subsequent to uh, when angels uh, fund deals. Um, so who are these angel investors? Well, they're entrepreneurs and experienced business people who are willing to invest time and money in portfolio companies. And as you'll see in a later slide, uh, there are several studies that now say that the time that angel investors spend with portfolio companies is many times more important than the money they're investing in companies. So um, this is not a passive investment class. It's an active investment class where we angels are engaged with our companies. Um, we're investing our mad money. Remember when I was giving you the analogy with going to Vegas? Uh, earlier, well, it's the same money that we take to play on the blackjack tables or the or the craps tables. 
Uh, it's mad money. It's not money that we're looking forward to paying for our retirement with. Uh, it's usually three to 10% of our net worth that we've committed to this asset class uh, because we want to stay involved or get involved in the angel community. Because it's so high risk, we generally have larger numbers of angel investments, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. If we have larger numbers of investments, and if we're active investors, it means that we're probably not gonna be active in every venture. So if there's 10 or 12 or even 20 investors in any one deal, frankly, the last thing any entrepreneur needs is 20 advisors. He needs one advisor or maybe two advisors and the best one, the ones who are, have the most experience in that business vertical. So usually we select an investor representative for, for every deal we do, and that person engages directly with the company as a director or a mentor or an advisor or a coach or all of the above, and the rest of the investors are passive in that deal. The next deal that comes along, it may be my turn. Now I need to be the investor representative. Yes, sir. Bill, uh, just to open the questions and then make sure that people are still awake. Uh, uh, I would like to ask about the, the involvement uh, in, in, in the deal. If, let's say that you have that situation where you have one, one lead investor and then nine passive ones. Would that uh, role change uh, while the company grows? Let's say that in the beginning it would be a different person in the, in the very early stage and then in, let's say, going into the international market, then you would have a different person. So did you, you hear that question that? in the back? Yes. yes, okay. So. I think what you're describing <clears throat> is actually a best practice. Now, most of the time, I think the original investor stays pretty engaged with the company for at least until uh, much bigger investors come along, and then maybe uh, the lead investor at the earlier stage takes a back seat or maybe even cycles off the board. I think that we as angels need to recognize what our strengths are and take our egos off the table and say, you know, this is not a merit badge, being on the board of directors of this private company. Uh, I'm trying to help this company grow as rapidly as possible. So my personal perspective is the day I go on the board of directors, the chairman gets my resignation. And uh, we can put that into effect anytime. And when I feel that others can help the company grow faster than I can. I'd rather play golf this afternoon, frankly, than uh, go to another board meeting. So we're all part-time investors, and there's, all, there's lots of companies that we can help. So we, my perspective is uh, as soon as we find somebody that could serve the role that we're serving in mentoring these companies better than we can is probably the right time to step aside. Now, is that gonna happen every six months? No, maybe once during the life of the company would a, a good transition point come along. Uh, but I like to see angel, uh, angel syndicates and angel groups engage the best possible member uh, in each of our portfolio companies. So um, I actually mentioned this, that uh, this Excuse guy, me, Josh can, Lerner. Can I still make another question? Yeah, absolutely, and, uh, sure. And, and, and that relates actually to the numbers that you mentioned in the third slide and, and uh, the question that we have been discussing uh, quite a lot actually in Finland is that uh, uh, at least earlier we uh, discussed and talked about numbers that were between maybe 50 or 100,000 euros that you need to do per investment more or less or per, per company as an investment and, uh, and, and uh, the discussion and which actually sort of raised the, the issue of establishing this organization also was that in in other countries, the numbers are not necessarily that high. And of course here we are talking about syndication that you, you, can, you can get in with, with maybe with some smaller numbers. But uh, at least I have read that in, in the US, a very typical uh, investment is something like $20,000, uh, which is far less than 50,000 euros, uh, for the time being anyway. And, and uh, But when you also measured uh, how much of your uh, wealth you should invest in, in this kind of investments, uh, what would you say is the number of uh, uh, wealth, uh, liquid wealth that you actually need to be able to do it, to be in this business? Uh, and 
when we were doing some calculations earlier, I, I forbid more or less those calculations, they came up with numbers that if you, have, if you are worth at least 10 million euros, you can consider mm. this. And uh, then you don't have too many, at least in this country. Okay, so, <laughs> so the question is, uh, how big, uh, what sort of the minimum net worth that one should have to be an angel <coughs> investor? Well, it depends on your risk tolerance and your age to some degree. Um, um, uh, 10% is the maximum amount of my net worth I will put into angel deals. For other people, it's 3%. Uh, I know angel investors who have 30% of their net worth committed. So uh, figure out what your commitment is and divide that by 20. And that's the average check size you should write. Why 20? Well, you need to have 10 investments. And you know, you entrepreneurs, you always need twice as much money as you tell us you need. So we're going to have to write at least two checks. So 10 companies times two checks is 20, divided into your the amount that you have personally committed to this asset class, and that's the size checks that you ought to be writing. Now, we have angels in the US who routine, routinely write 5,000 checks, uh, $5,000, and we have angels who routinely write uh, more than $100,000 checks. Um, the average is 30,000. Um, um, but um, angels are angels. And so we see a lot of uh, all over the spectrum of uh, people writing check size. Did that, did that address your question? Uh, maybe at least partly. Please. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you uh, take uh, 10 companies yep. and, and uh, uh, you do the math, of uh, let's say uh, $20,000 and you have to make uh, 20 investments, that's $40,000. If it's gonna be 10% uh, of your net worth, then you need to be $4 million error, about $4 million net worth. If that's, if that's how, how you choose the numbers, 10% of your net worth. If you want it to be 20% of your net worth, it's different. It's a different calculation. Uh, that, do you see any, any differences in this, this respect? Uh, when you look at different fields of business, uh, one can understand that it's, it's very high risky in, in ICT, in, in, in that area more or less. When you take more traditional business areas, uh, maybe the risk is not that high. Uh, I disagree. Okay. I don't think there's any uh, relationship between uh, uh, risk and business sector. Restaurants, now there's a traditional business sector. Failure rate is 70 percent, higher than software companies. So uh, it's uh, you know there is a. Uh, I know many friends who say, well, I'm going to invest in this low risk startup company over here because they're in the furniture business or the food business or the rest uh, restaurant business, and I'm not going to invest in this medical device company or this software company here because those are high risk. And we can't find any uh, relationship for startup companies right at the beginning between risk and business vertical. Uh, they're all risky. <laughs> Just sort of figure on a 50% risk uh, failure rate. So uh, this guy, Josh Lerner, is maybe the most famous uh, <clears throat> academician in the U.S. who has looked at venture capital environment. He just finished a study last or two years ago on angel investing, and he is, he came, actually it made me feel very good when he came out and said, to the best of his knowledge, the value of the time that angels put with their portfolio companies is at least as important as their money. Uh, that, that was really a good for us. Now, let's look at motivation for angel investors. If you're a venture capitalist, you're investing other people's money. If your motivation for investing other people's money is anything other than return on investment, you're in the wrong business. But angel investors are investing their own money. And, you know, on this stuff, the time we put in our portfolio companies, we get no return on investment. Our ROI is all on the money that we put in the portfolio companies. So 
we're doing the time that we put into portfolio companies as, as an altruistic return. It could be that an entrepreneur mentored us when we were younger and we want to give back. We could have uh, economic development motivation that says, I'd like to see my community diversify. Uh, it could be that we just don't like golf well enough to play every day, so we need something else to do. Or it could be that our spouse said, I married you for better or worse, but not for lunch. So find something to do and don't be hanging around the house all the time. Uh, and all of those are reasonable motivations to be angel investors. Now, I can't speak for Finland, but I have been studying the, this area of job creation um, as an amateur for some time. And I was very much struck by the following data published by the Kauffman Foundation in November of 2009 for the Obama Job Summit. Uh, Kauffman Foundation is the largest foundation in the world with a focus on accelerating entrepreneurship. And here's the chart. The gray bars are recessions. The blue bars are jobs created by companies less than three years, five years old. And the red bars are jobs created by companies that are older than five years old. You'll see that there's a lot of jobs created by young companies and not so many jobs created by old companies. The, one of the authors said that in the last 30 years, entrepreneurs, that is companies that are less than five years old, have created 40 million jobs in the U.S. and companies that are over five years old created less than zero. Is this net? Or is this a net. So net job failure, creation. Failure. Net job creation. So for every job that Google creates, since they're more than five years old, Chrysler lays off somebody, or somebody else lays off somebody. So uh, company, big companies that have been around for more than five years, uh, over the last 30 years net, have, uh, have had no impact on job creation in the US. It's all been done by, by uh, younger companies. Now, do I have any evidence that Angels created all those jobs? I sure do not. I wish I did. But I can tell you that those companies less than five years old are right in the sweet spot of the 20,000 or so companies that we in the U.S. fund as angel investors every year. So any questions about that? Yes, sir. Maybe not question, but uh, uh, I think uh, situation in Finland as well. Uh, I don't recall the exact numbers, but uh, especially on the ICT field, when we have been so much laid on one big company, Nokia. Now the meaning of uh, scalable startups is very crucial to the national economy <coughs> of Finland. Somebody may know that better because people made a very good study on that and has uh, influenced our government to support uh, these growth companies. Good. Well, I mean, I think um, much of the data we have everywhere is a bit anecdotal, uh, but we're beginning to gather more robust data, and I was really tickled, really excited about seeing that data come out from Kauffman Foundation two years ago. Any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Maybe, maybe one, one uh, comment or question also. If you, if you also in Finland, we talk a lot, a lot about uh, the startup companies and, and really uh, in order to be able to get some, some funding and, and, uh, and, uh, and grants, you need to be actually less than six years old as a company. But then there are many companies in Finland that are maybe much older. They are still small, but they have very good potential. They need a new, new team, a new entrepreneur, and they can be sort of real startup companies in that sense. Is there any data from the U.S. that, uh, that uh, actually in these older companies there are uh, real, uh, real uh, pearls? So I would say that uh, my experience is that 
a, probably a third of the companies that I've invested in have been older companies um, that uh, may be a IT consulting company that uh, finally, after doing the same thing for several companies, came out with a packaged piece of software that they want to commercialize uh, broadly, uh, and they and they uh, want mo to raise money to do that. Um, so I I have funded. I think most angels have funded companies that have a small ongoing component of a service business that they want to convert into a product business. I will add this: the transition from um, service. Uh, entrepreneurship to product, uh, a product company is not an easy transition. Um, entrepreneurs who have been self-funded um, are very creative at um, raising money, at selling things, at uh, picking the lowest hanging fruit. But when we fund them, we want them to focus on commercializing this product. And sometimes that's actually a hard transition because they've been chasing every opportunity on the rainbow and now we're saying, no, you're, we're giving you money, you're gonna chase this opportunity on the rainbow. So it's a hard transition to make for some. Nonetheless, I would say about a third of the companies that I've invested have been exactly that model. I think what you have to be careful of is that the team is ready to focus all their energy on commercializing one product and not chasing every opportunity that comes along in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, this is, uh, I find this very important uh, <coughs> slide. It's one of the, the best slides uh, I have seen in the international forum for, for, uh, for the several, uh, several shows that I have seen. Uh, but uh, basically that also says that there needs to be some some kind of uh, uh, creative destru uh, destruction uh, of, of, of companies that that they are uh, constantly new companies. They are never the same companies that are five years old or less. They they are constantly new. So so uh, how do you? How, but how don't do you, you think that's what entrepreneurship is? Exactly, creative destruction. Ex ex exactly. <laughs> but it, but it strikes me quite. Uh, if you look at the numbers and the job creation of. of uh, companies that are less than five years old, it's almost, almost uh, like a flat. Uh, yeah, that's it, surprising it, to me it, too. It's a constant, uh, it, it seems like, like the innovation is, is, uh, is like a uh, nominal value. Yeah. That there is yes, a, and, and I can't explain why it, 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 uh, th three million jobs per year uh, yeah. from this, this slide. Uh, I will say that notice that the data stops at 2005. And one of the b basic reasons for that is that it takes quite a while to gather all of this data and sort it out uh, and make sure you're actually looking at real trends. Uh, but the data was done in 09, and from what I have heard, there was a significant dip in job creation in the U.S., maybe a bigger dip than we saw anyplace else um, in uh, 09 and 10, but it's back up again. So. Entrepreneurial startups and job creation are uh, back and very active. I think you know that we're having troubles with unemployment, as are many, uh, uh, many countries. Uh, and right now, the, the private sector is doing fine. The public sector is, uh, is offsetting, essentially, what the private sector is doing in job creation. But I think uh, cre creative destruction is what entrepreneurship is all about. Uh, and I think we're back to seeing uh, quite a bit of job creation in the U.S. from, from new ventures. So let's talk about uh, portfolio strategy. So the, the classic assumptions in angel investing until November of 2007 were, well, okay, this is a pretty high risk field. Uh, we better invest in uh, lots of companies. Uh, we're looking for home runs, we're looking for big exits, not a bunch of little exits, we're looking for a few big exits. And based on some of the VC data in very early stage, we ought to be kind of thinking about maybe a pretty high uh, internal rate of return, interest rate uh, rate of return, but we frankly didn't have any data. So we just tried to have a 
um, rough idea as to what a strategy would, could be. And then in a professor from the, uh, a small university in Oregon uh, got permission to study angels in groups in the U.S. and published that data in November of 07, and then uh, about 18 months later published a similar study in the U.K., and this is the first data we ever had on returns for angels investing in groups. And you'll notice that in the top three lines, it sort of describes the two studies. There were 539 angels in the U.S. group, 158 in the U.K. group, and the analysis was of the exits only, so the third line. 1,137 exits in the U.S., 406 exits in the U.K. He did not try to assign residual value to the ongoing ventures, as you would expect, uh, as you see in venture capital calculations. He simply looked at uh, the returns from exits. Now, uh, feast your eyes on the bottom line. More than 50% 50 50 of the companies in both studies did not return capital. So if you invested uh, 20,000 euros in a company, you got back something less than 20,000 euros at exit. In fact, 35 of the 50% gave back zero. 15% of the 35% gave back some capital. So most of these 50% uh, losses were complete failures, zero return. But look at the ROI line. Uh, that's cat, our definition, the way we use the expression return on investment or ROI as angels is simply cash on cash. Forget about the number of years. If you invest a dollar, do you get three dollars back? If so, that's a 3x investment. Uh, so that was about uh, two and a half times your money back, depending on where you were. Uh, the IRR calculation was about 25% uh, per year, uh, depending upon the, the region. Uh, probably the most significant line on here is this, and that is that uh, less than 10% of the investments gave three quarters or more of the return on investment. Now, if you think carefully about return on investment, um, part of it, if you're getting a 3x return on investment, the first third is getting your money back. That's 1x. So uh, if 67% uh, of the companies 60% uh, of the yield came from 10% of the companies. That would be all the upside. So actually, 75 and 80% means that less than 10% gave more than all of the upside, gave some of the return of capital as well. So um, 9 out of 10 of the companies uh, didn't quite give capital back, and I'm going to show you a little more about that in a minute too. But is this view on, on a portfolio? Of the, all of the portfolio, yes. Excluding those which are ongoing still. Yes. But all the failures are in. All the failures in. Does, and mean, uh, does this uh, mean that uh, in the end of the day, if you compare that you put your money in the stock exchange uh, or bank, you get better return in average? But in business angels? No, you'll get a, a 20 percent, better than 20 percent with angels. So you'll be better with angels than uh, if you've got the stomach for it. If you've got the stomach for that line right there, and my mother does it, well, my mother's been deceased for a few years, so, uh, but uh, my mother wouldn't have when she was alive. So uh, some people don't have the tolerance, the risk tolerance to lose half the money and be patient to wait for that 20% return. The one thing I want to point out to you on this chart that's totally misleading is this number about years to exit, 3.5 and 4 years to exit. Trust me, do not depend upon that piece of data. What happens in the first three years on your investment as an angel investor in your portfolio? Only thing that happens is a few companies go out of business. So if you want to measure your portfolio success, 
after the average period of time, you'll be negative. It's only after you've had all the exits in your portfolio that you'll be positive. All the positive stuff happens in the second half of, uh, of the life of your portfolio companies. So any questions on that chart? How, how is it? I, <coughs> I, I, was, I was a week back actually in the Finnish parliament in a hearing uh, in, in a, <coughs> as an expert. And I, I more or less gave these kind of figures there also. And there were some of these major pension funds from Finland also that uh, participated or their representatives are experts there. And, uh, and I, I show, showed these figures and said that, well, actually the Finnish pension funds should put their money uh, in, in the, to business angels because that would give a return of 20 to 30 percent instead of this minus something that they get otherwise. How'd that work out for you? <laughs> and um, they didn't agree. They said it's so all false. Oh, oh, false. Oh, all false. That's okay. not true. I see. And, and uh, because they had lost of money in, in, in venture capital. In, in venture capital uh. investment. I've got some great data on venture capital, and they have lost money in the last 10 years. Well, that's what, the, that's what they also said, but uh, have you been able to convert uh, pension funds uh, in, in well, the U.S. to, to invest uh, in startups? So, so remember that this is all our own money, yeah. and we're not investing other people's money. Yeah. So, but there are some uh, um, government and uh, pension monies that are have been put into um, what we call sidecar investments or co-investments, uh, co-investment funds or matching funds where the angels do the heavy lifting and then uh, either a government or another fund will invest and will match that fund, maybe a 50% match or a 30% match or a 100% match up to a certain cap. So we do see some of that. Uh, not so much more, it's much more likely to come from a government sector than it is from a pension plan or endowment. But we'll, be, we'll see. I think the people are only beginning to understand this asset class. I mean, if you have no data until November of 2007, the pension plans are not going to pay any attention to it. So what we're, what's going to happen is in a couple more years, this guy's going to repeat the study, I'm sure. And then, uh, then we'll see. Uh, you get two or three data points, then maybe there'll be enough uh, information to convince uh, bigger investors to do sidecar. Side sidecar, side investing, co-investing funds. Yes, sir. But there uh, isn't uh, included uh, a huge time investment in this, your own time, which you could maybe do consulting work and make a lot of money. So if people envy, envy this, then they should realize that you put your money in uh, also your time, not just money. Yes, and I think that um, there are two aspects to that. The first is um, that sometimes the co-investment funds, there's an administrative charge that goes back to help run the in angel syndicate uh, to reduce the dues of the members. So that's one way you could compensate for that difference. We're also working on possible ways to uh, reward the angels who do the heavy lifting with warrant coverage or uh, something like that. In the US, it's not legal to have success fees, but in other jurisdictions, it is. So you can think through how you can reward the people who are doing the heavy lifting, if, especially if you've got a, a, a big sidecar fund that's investing alongside your group. Yeah, that's a possibility. Yes? Yes, those numbers clearly look very good, of course. 27% uh, would be very nice for any one of us. Uh, so you need to have an exit though, right? Yes. It's I hard to do that with no exits. Yes, I understand that. But uh, you tend to think that, uh, that those numbers are maybe from the successful ones. You know, it, it tends to be so that the people that uh, lose money, they don't like to talk about it so much. And then the ones that, that really make money, they, uh, they talk more and, and, and it's easier for them to talk. Uh, so do, do you have, a, or do you recall that, that where those uh, from certain area, from, from uh, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, angels or tech? Uh, so so this guy's are? name is Rob Wiltbank. Yeah. He's a professor at Willamette University. And he published some data on returns before 07. And several of us who have been angel investing for a long time went and sat down with him 
and told him about uh, survey bias and explained to him that uh, wealthy people tend to talk about their successes and not about their failures. So he actually had several tests in this data to look at uh, 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 survey bias. Uh, and I, we, we, to our satisfaction, we believe he minimized it. Did he eliminate it? Probably not. But he actually took that into account. And so he had some, he had some questions in his survey uh, that helped him redu reduce uh, survey bias. But that's a really good question. Yeah. And, and maybe it's just a comment on, on, on that, that the uh, return on investment on the, or return on equity in Finland over the cycle on private companies, on average, all of the Finnish companies, non-public companies, it's about 16%. So, so in Finland, if you own a restaurant, you will most likely make 16% if it's not going bust then you will make 16% on your equity. Uh, so 22% in, in, in UK, could you pick, you know, could, could we enhance the, the return on it? Sure. So, so it, it, it's maybe possible, but that, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I, I, I think feel that those are a little bit optimistic numbers. I think angels in these two jurisdictions are going to have better numbers next time. Because we're do I know we're doing better due diligence, mm -hmm. we're putting together better term sheets, we're doing deals at lower valuation, and all of those things are going to enhance our returns. Yes, sir. It's, you have an experience on the lesser markets because both, both of these have functioning uh, stock markets. What, what happens really because we don't really have a functioning? It's, uh, I don't think those had very much to do with the existing of public markets because a uh, very tiny fraction of angel deals actually go public. Almost all of them are trade sales. Yeah. yeah, but it's typically the public companies uh, acquiring the companies, if you look what's... Oh, but we never pay any attention to where the company is. We'd love to sell companies to Nokia. You know, so it's... Uh, uh, I, when you're talking about a company generating revenues, going offshore can be difficult. If you're talking about selling a company, you know, uh, Siemens, uh, uh, the Japanese companies, the Chinese companies, uh, the U.S. companies, they're all fair game. Wherever the big companies are that are in the right space, it's rather easy to get their attention. So I don't think that's a critical factor uh, for, for the M&A transaction. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. This is the data on returns from the same, from the same U.S. World Bank study. So... Um, Notice that the failures happened in the first three years and the successes took six years or even longer. I have two rather nice positive exits in my portfolio after 15 years. Be patient, in angel investors. Uh, I also have one after 18 months. That was a really good one. Um, but uh, it could take a while before you get a, a great a great exit. But again, pointing out this average holding period of three and a half years is not very meaningful because this is all that happens in the first uh, uh, three and a half years in most cases. Um, again, uh, this is a, a little plot that I made up. Um, based on my experience, we are going to have some exits uh, at uh, times that are lower than the Wilt Bank data. We're probably going to have a lot of exits that are going to take uh, substantially longer than the Wilt Bank data as well. Um, so what we can conclude uh, from the Wilt Bank data is that, number one, since we get so few great exits, we need to invest in companies, then each company has to have the potential to be a big exit. 10x, 20x, 30x. We can't afford to invest. If one in 10 is going to give us all of our upside and we invest in some potential 2x's and 3x's and 10x's and 20x's and 30x's, the winner is always going to be the 1 or 2x, right? So we're going to be underwater for our whole portfolio. So we have to make sure that all of the companies we invest in have the potential to scale. We got to invest in a lot of companies. And we better be pretty patient uh, investors. So um, our suggestion is that angels consider 
10 to 25 lifetime investments as the right kind of number. Um, and uh, if you invest in more than that number of deals, your chance of success is pretty reasonable. Um, and let me show you, this seems to come up a lot, doesn't it? Gaming, gambling and gaming in my talk. So um, maybe it's because I live in Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about a gaming analogy to angel investment. So let's say you play a game where you bet a dollar and you pick a number between 0 and 11. So 1 through 10. If you get the number, if you get the number right, you get $25. But you're and you're betting $1. So there is an anticipated return on this kind of gaming, it's called that you'll get two and a half times your money back. You can bet on it, bet on every number. You bet ten bucks and you get twenty-five bucks back. That's a pretty good deal. Um, so it's a very skewed return, but your anticipated or your expected value for this return on investment is two point five times your money. So if you play one time, you're almost a hundred percent chance you're going to lose all your money, but you could make 25 times your money. If you play 5,000 times, you're pretty much assured of a 2.5x. If you play three times, well, you could make 8x. That would be one win out of three. You could make 17x. That would be two wins out of three. You could make 25x, that would be three wins out of three. But most likely you're going to make zero if you bet three times in this, in this game. So think of angel investing and portfolio strategy a little bit like this. If you bet enough, the likelihood that you're going to get about two and a half times your money back uh, is pretty good. So sort of the lessons learned here is you need, to, you need to make a, a several investments, more than at least 10, and that if you do, you're likely to get this kind of return. And I want to reiterate the fact that you need to be pretty patient investors. If you want to dip your toe in the water and invest in one or two companies and see what happens, I can tell you right now, you're going to lose all your money. So. It, make a commitment if you're going to get into this asset class. Um, one of the guys that I actually spent quite a bit of time with, with um, Wilt Bank, when we first saw some of his first work, was a fellow by the name of Louis Villalobos. Louis, Louis Villalobos was a really smart guy. Uh, he was a math major from MIT, and he founded the Tech Coast Angels. And he and I worked on a lot of this stuff uh, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, and he's, he's the one that came up with this quote here that I love, lemons rot faster than plums ripen. That's really a good analogy for, uh, for angel investing. Um, so. To answer your question earlier about how much we should be investing in each deal. So if we're going to invest uh, in at least 10 deals, and we know we're going to make more than one investment, so let's assume two investments per deal, per, then, we're, then we have to determine what our uh, commitment to this asset class is. And most people, it's 3 to 10%, but some people are different than that then I suggest that the check size should be the amount of your assets you're committing to angel investing divided by 20. Um, now you say to me, yes, but some angel investments require four checks or even five checks. So why should I only commit two checks? Well, I'm hoping that you'll be smarter than me and not write the second check for as many companies that failed that I write, wrote two checks for. Maybe you'll only write one check for those companies that are going to fail and three or four checks for those companies that are going to be successful. So I think almost every uh, old angel that stands before you 
will say, do what I say, not what I did. Because what I did when I started angel investing is what most people do. I started writing checks. And after about five checks, I said, what am I doing? What is this asset class? What kind of commitment am I going to make for my assets? Is it, what fraction of my assets are I going to commit? How big a check should I be writing? I didn't ask that question until I'd written about five checks. So uh, uh, we're trying to give you some input to help you make some of these decisions earlier than we did. Um, so, oh, this is, a, this is a really good question. It comes up all the time. And that is, should I write, a, 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 assuming that the company needs more money, and assuming that the company can find that money someplace besides my pocket, should I choose to invest in that company anyway to avoid dilution? So maintain my percentage of ownership by making follow-on investments. Um, that's a personal choice. Uh, and some investors do, and some investors don't. What's the strategy of the investors that don't? It's a diversification strategy. Do I want to invest 20,000 more euros in the company I invested in a year ago, or 20,000 euros in another new company? Assuming that I'm sort of at my cap of how much I want to invest in this asset class. My personal choice is diversification. So, um, I don't tend to automatically invest in companies that I've invested in earlier. Now, if I'm a board member, I have to show good faith and, and invest in the company. But if I have a choice and the company's going to be successful in raising the money, then I probably won't write another check. Villa Lobos, the guy I was talking to you earlier, very, very successful angel investor. He made 67 investments before he died a couple of years ago. He tended to follow his investment. So, is there a right? We had about the same kind of portfolio returns. There's no right or wrong answer here. It's just a sort of a gut feel as to what you want to do. Now, a lot of times a company will need your money, and since you invested in the first round, they may not make it with your out your investment in the second round, and you will feel a responsibility to. But at times when it's your choice, then you have to make a personal decision. Uh, many people are worried about dilution. Well, if I don't invest in the next round, then I get diluted. I don't care about dilution. I care about share price. Did the value go up? Is my, are my dollar shares now worth $3 a share in the next round? Great! I already got a winner on the way here. So, actually, I dilute my IRR a little bit if I invest at a higher price. So, I'm not, I don't care at all about dilution. Uh, I care about share price of the prices that I bought. Any questions about that? Can I have one? Absolutely. So in most of the cases, angels come to us and say that um, I want to have anti-dilution clause. How, how, how would you suggest that we, we, we handle that? Um, so the question is, uh, do angels typically put an anti-dilution clause in their term sheets? And I think the answer is yes. Um, I think it's not very dangerous to you as an entrepreneur if, um, if uh, it's a weighted average anti-dilution clause. I would not uh, sign a term sheet with a full ratchet anti-dilution clause. Um, the, if you think you're an entrepreneur and you think you have raised money at a pretty darn high valuation, then you better be concerned about anti-dilution because the next round's just likely to be lower. And so if you're doing the deal, it's priced right, uh, and you're an entrepreneur, I wouldn't be very nervous about, uh, about a weighted average uh, anti-dilution clause, but I wouldn't sign a full ratchet. Any other questions? This chart basically re is to remind me to tell you that all I've talked about so far is scalability and diversification. Well, there's a lot more to making an angel deal than whether the deal scales and whether you have a lot of uh, deals in your portfolio strategy. So obviously, we're very concerned about the management team. 
the intellectual property, the competitive advantage, and we're going to get into that later in the day. Uh, but I just wanted you, wanted you to understand that scale and diversification are key to our portfolio strategy, but they're not the single key factors in making any individual decision. So, any questions? So let me go on through another section or so. Yeah, and then we'll take a break. Um, but how often do you see business sales angels asking the question, what's your exit strategy to start? One hundred percent of the times. That's because two reasons. Number one, we want to make sure that you as an entrepreneur uh, don't plan on giving this company to your children. That you don't think we're banks and you can pay us back and then build the company and give it to your children. Uh, so we want to exit when you exit. And the second reason is I've actually run across a couple of companies in my career that there was no exit possibility. It was a nice company, but it was in a place where nobody would ever want to buy it. And so we always like to think about not just is there an exit strategy, but who might want to buy the company. So exit strategy, we will talk to you about your exit strategy at our first meeting. It's my third question. Surprisingly and, enough, that's not the case in Finland. Uh, okay. Well, uh, it will. It will be. Be patient. It will be. <laughs> um, One more question, though. Yep, absolutely. Uh, like when you say that uh, you should have at least 10 investments, so over what time is that? Over your lifetime. So you can have one at the single moment, and it's enough. Uh, absolutely, as long as you're committed to making some more, or you just don't care what your uh, return on investment is. Uh, the, the point here is that you have to acknowledge the fact that to get one home run, you're going to have to have uh, 50 times with the bat in your hand. I mean, uh, 10 times with the bat in your hand. Um, so uh, our batting average as angel investors is much lower than most cricket players and most baseball players. So uh, we're not very good at what we're doing. It's a very high risk asset class. So let's talk a little bit now, shifting gears, we'll talk about uh, group investing versus solo angel investing. Now, I told you that I made my first angel investment in 1980, and I didn't tell you that I joined my first angel group in 1997. So I made about 40% of my angel investments before there were groups, and about 60% since there have been angel groups. So I have experience on both sides. Um, I think solo angel investing is hard work and can be pretty expensive. Um, it's just difficult to find deals. It's difficult to do due diligence. You have to read a lot of business plans. It's just a lot of work piled on top of, uh, of more work when you're trying to do it as a solo angel investor. Um, the, there are some advantages of being a solo angel investor. Uh, you can take as, as little or much of a round of investment as you want. You can actually take control of the deal. You can move very quickly on uh, hot deals. Uh, and you can negotiate your own term sheets. Uh, the disadvantages are that it's, it's difficult, it's hard work, especially if you're looking for uh, uh, deals that you know a lot about or you need to find an expert to help you evaluate a deal. Um, I would say also that solo angel investment leads to fewer investments and bigger checks. Um, and that's not necessarily in compliance with best practice on portfolio strategy. Um, uh, and I think solo angels, as a solo angel, I surely thought about that. Um, I made a decision eight years ago to only invest through the two syndicates that I'm a member of. If you come to me as an entrepreneur, and you're looking for funding, I will tell you that uh, I invest through these two groups, so please apply for funding from those two groups. I won't even take your business plan. It, you, there's a very easy way to submit it on the internet, and I'm on the screening committee of both groups. I'll see it anyway. Uh, so I don't, I don't go to networking events anymore and carry home uh, 10 business plans, which I, which I used to do a lot. So um, 
So here are some of the uh, group investing. I think that as a group, we see a lot more deals. We've got more resources in the group to evaluate deals. Uh, we've got more expertise in the group for the post-investment relationship. So serving as directors, mentors, coaches. Um, and I think that in the long run, we're going to find that our returns are better uh, for, uh, for deals done through groups. And I will share later with you some evidence that we've got about group due diligence that uh, was uh, which really very surprising to me when this Wilpack study came out. So, um, we've already bit, we've already talked about talked through most of this as to what the what the uh, returns are going to be. Uh, I think the point here is that um, we investing in groups uh, are going to see more deal flow. Um, I think, as I mentioned, uh, we have learned to do really good uh, due diligence, and we've. There was a time, however, when if an audience like this asked me if due diligence made any difference, so you could sit there and say to me, "Okay, Payne." Does it really make any difference to whether we do due diligence or we put all the companies up over here and take a dart and throw it over our shoulder because only one in 10 is going to hit anyway? I actually didn't have a good answer until the Wilfang study came out in 07. And here's the results of that study. The blue lines are low due diligence deals and the gold lines are high due diligence deals. The median due diligence in the Wilfang study was 20 hours. So for 20 hours of work, the median deal, the average return on investment for the whole uh, uh, portfolio was 2.6x. For those deals that did less than the median, less than 20 hours of due diligence, their return on investment was 1.1x. So the bottom half had very little return. For those that did greater than 20 hours, the return was 5.9x, and that should be greater than, not less than. The multiple of greater than 40 hours was 7.1x. That's an astounding difference. The companies that did less than 20 hours, which was half, uh, virtually half of the companies, got a 1.1x, and that small fraction that did more than 40 hours got seven times the return on investment for doing at least 40 hours of due diligence. Does due diligence matter? Yes, it does. Yes, sir. Uh, on this perspective, I would like to bring the, the notion about crowdfunding. OK. Uh, do you see any value uh, for uh, this kind of due diligence uh, having some crowdfunding in early stage? OK, so how much due diligence can the crowd do? None, right? So where are they going to end up on that chart? They're going to end up at the 1.1 at, 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 at the best. So I'm very concerned about uh, where crowdfunding could take us for a variety of other reasons, too. Yes, sir? I was thinking that uh, uh, in the end of the day, again, you're uh, investing on the core team, uh, not just the plan. And uh, you must spend time checking that team and maybe building the team. So is that a sort of a behind these figures? I would say um, of in when we're doing due diligence, I would say a third to 40% of the effort is on the team. Okay. And somewhere between 60 and uh, two thirds of the effort is on other things, competitive environment, intellectual property, et cetera, et cetera. But team is the most important component. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, if the due diligence is also to the point to, to experts, lawyers, um, accountants, is it also, how is it considered in the 20 hours? So we, you, you angel groups, um, well-organized angel groups usually don't pay for any due diligence. Um, I would say maybe 
uh, two or three deals out of ten, we we come up with a little bit of cash, usually for intellectual property uh, work. But if we can, most of the time we do it ourselves, or we have friends in the community who want to uh, have a good relationship with our angel organization, and they will help us do the do the intellectual property due diligence. But Generally, the amount per deal invested uh, in cash and due diligence is pretty minor, less than $1,000. We do, we do pay for uh, uh, financial background checks, uh, criminal background checks, um, and we might pay for intellectual property work, but it's going to be a pretty minor amount. I mean, if you're only investing 100,000 euros, you can't afford to spend 25,000 euros in in uh, you know paying somebody to do all your uh, heavy lifting on due diligence, so most of it gets done by us. Yeah, uh, in uh, in your group, then uh, it tends to be so that the in a kind of a group of a willing, uh, the, the the ones that uh, do the work, they seem to do always the same work, and you know you have the free riders that that. Uh, uh, like to follow you, but how do you, uh, how do you see that? Or how do well, you I mean, that's that? life. Um, uh, the, we are in situations where no matter where we are, uh, you know, 20% of the people do 80% of the effort. But I will say when we have new members coming into a group, we, we like to get them fully immersed and put them on a due diligence team almost right away. Um, even if they have no uh, business sector expertise. There's always, you know, uh, telephone background checks and stuff that uh, that uh, anybody who was interested in being an angel can do. So, and it's really helpful to new members to sort of understand the depth that we look into these companies before we write the check. So, uh, and, and sometimes if you get somebody, uh, put somebody on a due diligence team, they sort of get it right away that they're going to have to do some heavy lifting. But I won't, uh, I won't argue with the number, the fact that uh, there are a significant fraction, a small fraction is going to do a significant amount of the heavy lifting. Um, I'm a member of two groups, and in one group, probably 20% of the group or 15% of the group does all the work. But in the other group, about half the, half the people make a significant contribution. So it depends on a bit of the culture of the group, and, you know, there's just, just hard hard deciding in advance how that's going to work and you have to work hard in engaging all the members, yes. In your groups there is no internal compensation for the work done? No. Uh, we would like there to be some for the people who lead deals. We, we thought about some kind of option or warrant coverage, but we can't pay success fees. So we have to be very careful about that or, or we will be uh, in violation of some of our federal laws from the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, in the U.S. So most groups don't, but some groups are thinking about how we can do that. So let's look at a couple of other factors that affect returns. So um, the, the experience in the industry of the target company that uh, the angel investors have has a significant positive contribution on their returns. And the, mostly the best way to look at this is that high participation is the gold bars and the low participation is the blue ones. And these three categories, the gold bars are significantly higher. And I, in this case, I think the, uh, just the, we're talking about uh, investors with a lot of experience uh, in the business vertical of the company. Uh, we have another chart that uh, that comes right after this that basically says uh, our level of engagement with portfolio companies also helps returns. So this is angels who had uh, interacted with their portfolio companies once or twice a year was the blue bars, once or twice a month was the gold bars, and you can see we got about three times the return on investment for being heavily engaged with our portfolio companies. Um, so my experience is angel investing through angel groups gives me more choice of deals to invest in, 
uh, gives me a lot of support from other members with a lot of business vertical experience that both helps in due diligence and helps in the post-investment relationship, uh, directorships, etc. We're beginning to develop um, standardized due diligence checklist and standardized term sheets. In fact, some of our groups in the U.S. are now publishing our standardized term sheets on the website, so entrepreneurs can know in advance exactly what kind of terms that we're likely to be looking for. Now, the last bullet point on here. If you told me I would in, uh, join an investment club to make new friends, I would have told you, you are crazy as a loon. There's no way I want to build friendships by joining an investment club. Now I've been a member of four angel groups since uh, 1997, and about 80% of my uh, personal best friends are also members of an angel group somewhere. How could that happen? Well, you, you put 50 like-minded people who are at the same stage of life, who have some... Uh, some cash to spend, or so they're likely to go on cruises and vacations. It just happens. So it's, uh, but that, that is certainly not why I joined any angel group, but it is what happens when you have a, an active syndicate. Um, this is the growth in what we call angel groups, and this is a nice time for me to, uh, to do some definitions. So, in the U.S., angel groups are, consist of what you call syndicates, and, which we call networks, and funds. So angel fund is not like a venture capital fund. It's an angel organization where the members pool their money in advance, screen and scrub deals together, and then vote on whether to make an investment or not. A network or a syndicate deals, uh, the group screens and scrubs the deal together, and then some people don't write a check, and other people write a small check, and somebody else writes a bigger check. So uh, both of them, there are about 80% um, of U.S. groups are syndicates or networks, and 20% of U.S. angel groups are uh, funds. Um, and I'm actually a member of both. Um, and, and they both work. They, they both work uh, quite, quite well. Um, from the Wilfag study, here's the typical... Can I uh, yep, absolutely. Please. What is the form of your angel fund? Is it a company or is it just more rules? It hey, repeat the question. What is the... What is the theoretical form of... of oh, the form. Yeah. Um, it is what we in the U.S. call a limited liability corporation. So it is a form of a, of a it's a, a pass-through uh, corporation. So it means that all of the returns and all any tax uh, implications all pass through to the members of the fund. Common disputes to yeah. interest. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, it's a little harder to start an angel fund because you have to get the commitment from the members to invest. Um, so that's sort of a disadvantage of a fund is it's a little harder to start it. You've got to recruit all the members and get them to commit the right check, uh, sign the paperwork. On the other hand, during a recession, if you've already made the commitment to investing money, it's pretty easy to vote in favor of a deal if you really like it. If in a recession and you're in a network or a syndicate, and the rest of your portfolio in the market is really off, you're sort of slow to reach in your pocket and get your checkbook out from the next company that comes along. So my finding is that, just from personal observation, that funds are harder to raise, but they invest more consistently, and irregardless of the financial crisis or times. Um, networks, you can virtually put the people together in a room and start pitching deals at them right away. Uh, but sometimes they're slow to get their checkbooks out uh, during a recession. So there are good and bad. Uh, you've probably read this slide by now. This is what the typical angel in the Wilt Bank study looked like. Um, I guess I'm sort of surprised that uh, almost all of them uh, had uh, university 
uh, education. In fact, the average was at least a master's degree beyond the, or, or beyond the four year degree. Um, I think in the US, this average age is coming down because there are lots of younger, uh, younger um, entrepreneurs who have exited their company who now are investing in uh, startup companies. So I think the, I don't know how far down it has come since 07, but I think it's down significantly. Seeing a lot of young angels. Um, so if, we're, uh, if we are an angel investor, uh, we've got 10 portfolio companies. Uh, continue to recognize the fact that it's pretty unlikely we're going to be engaged with all of them. In fact, I think uh, the number of two or three is probably more appropriate than four. So it means we're going to be passive in seven or eight. The ones that we're active with, um, uh, we're going to be pretty engaged with as mentors or directors. And in the ones we're passive in, one of our other angels who invested in that deal, who probably has more business uh, sector experience, is going to be pretty engaged with that company. So um, the typical investment in the US is uh, somewhere between $150,000 and $2 million. In, and this is a <coughs> was a startling statistic that I just got in April. Um, the, the median angel round in the U.S. in 2011 was $700,000. But the local group only invested about 250000 So the lead group that found and did the initial due diligence on that deal only invested $250,000. And, and that's actually been pretty constant for the last six or eight years, the local group only puts in about a quarter of a million. The rest of it is syndicated with other groups. I should use the word co-invested. We found co-investment from other syndicates that were willing to invest with us in that deal. Two thirds of US deals now involve multiple syndicates. So uh, there'll be a lead investor and uh, the local group who is the lead investor will say, this company needs more money than our group can likely come up with. So they engage other groups from, uh, from the region uh, to invest in this deal. So that uh, co-investment with other groups has grown to become a very important component of angel investing in the US. Yes, sir? My experience is that the angel group activity is pretty local in the U.S. You don't see out-of-state investment so much. Is this true? And do you think that it is a general characteristic of this activity? Um, I think that angel investing in general is a local sport. And I think the reason for that is that most of us uh, who have been, who are angel investors, have been entrepreneurs or business people and we've been traveling our whole life. I have 4.5 million miles in the American Airlines Advantage program. Why would I ever want to get on another airplane in my life? And now we've got all this security crap going on. Gee whiz. Uh, I, think, I think I'll take a ferry or a train. Oh, I actually came here on a ferry. Um, so uh, going to other cities for uh, portfolio companies is not a high priority for me. But I will co-invest with angels from other regions, usually sort of nearby. I'm, I'm uh, located on sort of on the west coast, so I don't co-invest with very many people on the east coast of the US, but I've co-invested in a lot of deals led by other syndicates that showed the deal to me because they needed more money. I've actually done that relatively frequently. So I think angel investing is a local sport, but to get the diversification in our portfolios and to help other groups because they'll invest in our deals later, uh, we built up the trust and we will invest in, in other deals when there is a local angel that we trust who's leading that deal. We won't invest in an entrepreneur from, if, so if I'm in Las Vegas, 
and a Seattle entrepreneur approaches me, I'll tell him to go to the Seattle Angel Group. Then if I really like the deal, I'll call up my friend Dan Rosen, who runs the Alliance of Angels in Seattle, and say, hey, I'd like to put some money into that deal if you guys decide to invest. Because that means they're going to have uh, somebody who is managing that deal internally, serving on the board, etc. <coughs> okay, uh, generally we're going to get 20 to 40 percent of the company in our first round of investment. Um, it could be lower, it could be higher. I can give you examples of, of why we might be doing lower or, or higher, but generally it's in that range. In today's marketplace, um, I really don't like doing investments where our group is the, our syndicate is the lead angel group and we don't take a directorship. Uh, I've done that in the past and I've regretted it, so I'm sort of making a new policy that that when I do this in the future, our group is going to have board representation. And we're doing term sheets where uh, the board is defined in the term sheet, and there'll be some other uh, uh, terms and conditions that are rather typical in the kinds of deals that we do. Um, there'll be uh, five to 20 angels that, in make, that invest in, in every round, and uh, we try to pick the best possible represent, uh, investor representative. Uh, they could have uh, great vertical expertise or business segment expertise. They've got to have the time to put, put in the company. We'd like them to understand the concept of an early exit and have some M&A experience. And clearly, if they don't get along with the entrepreneur, that's not going to work. So we find somebody that has some rapport there. Rapport. Um, most of the rest of us are involved on an as-needed basis, can be involved on an as-needed basis. Um, uh, and that happens to me very frequently that there'll be some issue come up and I get a phone call from a portfolio company or the, the director representative for our group in a portfolio company who needs an introduction or uh, has some kind of some sort of question related to corporate governance or something. Um, <coughs> think I have well. These are some of the some of the engagements we have. Uh, mentor, advisor, and director. I've mentioned. At times, we will step in as an employee on an emergency basis to replace one of the key. Uh, individuals in case of some kind of an emergency, but it's very, very seldom more than a temporary uh, relationship. We have a major responsibility in helping portfolio companies raise more money, be it another angel round or venture capital, and we a, a better practice has become for us to help tee the company up for an exit. Not just any exit, but an exit that happens earlier rather than later. And I have two companies in my portfolio out of 12 companies that are sort of alive uh, that we're currently doing an exit on, one of which has zero <coughs> revenues. So we're doing a pre-revenue exit uh, for something in excess of $20 million and the second one that has very minor revenues, less than a less than million dollars a year, that we're hoping for the same kind of, of exit on. So we're modifying our uh, personal strategies as angels on when we can exit these companies. We used to sit around and wait for an offer to come in. We're taking a much more uh, proactive approach to exits these days. And that's, in fact, what I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, on the uh, workshop we have planned for Thursday morning. Yes, sir? What is your preferred point of exit? There are multiple approaches to look into that. So now you are coming uh, on a strategic exit rather than, than a valuation exit. So well, I never want to do a valuation exit. That implies a financial buyer. My experience with financial buyers is they're bottom feeders. Uh, so they want to buy the company for the lowest price possible price. Um, 
Uh, I would always want to do a strategic exit, whether it's early or late, and I want to do it through an auction. I want to create uh, three or four, uh, well, uh, let's say three uh, buyers who, who just can't live without buying my company. Just can't live, can't see another morning without owning my, my company. So uh, that creates a really good price. And uh, that's, that's uh, uh, a really new emerging uh, important angel strategy because the venture capital market has disappeared as an investor. And when they do invest, it takes forever to exit. The time to exit for VC deals is way up over where it was 10 years ago. So we have to modify our strategy. Again, Thursday morning we'll be talking about that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What do you think about indirect involvement of business angels in target companies? In Finland, uh, we have seen uh, this development, especially in foreign global type of companies, where they have established international management advisory boards and international scientific advisory councils. And uh, all of these members are business angels. So um, I, I think my answer to your question is that I actually like advisory boards um, as long as they have a very specific purpose. And um, and as long as they don't confuse the fact that they are not, do not have fiduciary responsibility, they're not the directors of the corporation, so uh, they're driving towards some purpose like exports or uh, uh, technology in the case of a scientific advisory board. Some scientific advisory boards, especially in big pharma companies, are names on the letterhead, and that may be a good idea too, you know, but they never meet. So you've given somebody 1% of the equity so you can put their name on your letterhead because they're famous in this life science industry. Um, I don't invest so much in life science deals, so that doesn't have, tend to come up with me. Uh, I really like for entrepreneurs who have not had investment to have advisory boards. Don't worry so much about fiduciary boards, you know, make it minimal your, your uh, wife and your dog and you be the, uh, be the board of directors, but uh, expect the fact that when investors come along, we're gonna build a, a real board of directors, and if the advisory board is going to continue, it has to have a very specific role, not just general advisory. These foreign robots are facing, obviously, the largest possible managerial challenge, because coming from a small, an open economy like Finland, they should global, not internationalize, but globalize their activities within the first coming three to five years. Yes, I agree. And I, I spent a lot of, I spent six months in New Zealand in the last two years, and you think you have problems <laughs> exporting. Go to New Zealand. They're 10,000 kilometers from land, other land, <laughs> other land with real markets, anyway.